guys in? Come in here. Have, uh, okay, they come in here, you know, they'll come in here. You know, one day, sit out in the outskirts of the dog yard. Maybe if you take off with your dogs, they come into the dog yards and haul their dog bones off into the bushes. You know, we find, you know, where the dog, the wolves are taking them off into the bushes. You know, but usually they stay away from the, stay away from the dogs. I've never had them attack them, let's put it that way, but it, it just looks, you know, you got the kid around here, and here's this wolf 100 feet away sitting there for a half hour while you're right outside looking at it, you know. There's something wrong with that wolf. You got a child out there, you're worried. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after about two or three days of that, I'll pop them. You know, I'll never do it the first time, hoping he just leaves, you know. Yep. Scare him, shoot him, shoot a 22 bullet over his head or something. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we'll pop him. And, and man, I tell you, I've, I've seen wolves, you know, like a, a skinny dog, you know. I always, like, used to take my dog sometimes and put my hands around there their waist, you know, right where it meets the, whatever it is, pelvis or something. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you can put the, your hand right around there and almost touch your fingers, you know. Yeah. You, know, you get them like that small or something. And, uh, you know, the dog would just be skinny. You'd just be feeling those ribs and stuff and, you know, wishing you had more food for them. And, but these wolves that come in here, you know darn well. I mean, I'm talking about 55-pound dogs now that I'm doing this to. These wolves, as they were fed like a a house dog would probably weigh 85 pounds, 90 pounds, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, a good tall animal. And I, I swear, I've taken some of these wolves and touched my fingers. And there was one wolf, I remember, you know, that I that I actually crossed my little fingers on the bottom. My God. I mean, and that was, you know, I mean, just nothing but literally skin and bones, you know. Yep. And He's run off by the pack. Yeah, oh. Skinny for some reason. Yeah, yeah just starving, you know. Man, the tail. thickness of the door here and build an extra thick door upon his wife's demand. during the winter months and then slide it out. Yeah, well this is, like I say, a lot more snow than normal. Well, even this amount of snow, if it made it this far, this amount of snow off the roof will be. Did you have to do this every year? Uh, I gotta do it because of that stove pipe. Usually I just let it slide off. Yeah, the stove pipe there is melting it and some ice building up, huh? Uh, what happens is uh, this whole thing, if it goes at once, it'll take the uh, stove pipe off. Take the stove pipe off, just rip the whole roof jack off. Yeah, yeah. Which it's done before. Uh -huh. And last time I did it, I did a nice job on it. But, but I actually am not really worried too much about that right now. I just figured I'd take some of the weight off here. Yep. This is that back pole. The hell, I just took off many hundreds of pounds. I'm sure right. it will be all right now. That's a chainsaw guy there. Uh-huh. It's just the first thing you put on. Yep. On the log. To do the first cut. What is the screen for down on this end, Stan? Huh? What's this screen unit here for? That used to be for sifting 
dirt for like uh, uh, right. the greenhouse or yeah. plants. These are all the uh, things we used to put the uh, dividers in for the plants. Yep, yep, put them in your greenhouse. See, that's, that's, that's really a quality board. That's rough cut. Yeah, with yeah. a chainsaw. That's never been touched. God, it's a beautiful cut. There's the unit that you use to push the salmon eggs in. Yeah, see the tip on it and the big holes. Yeah. Rotate it a little. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then your plunger went up at your end there. Right, you stick that in the gravel and then... Oh, let's see, do I still have my plunger? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the other end of the plunger is down in the pole. Yeah. We'll just act like it has a moose hide. Moose hide, uh, just like in a well. A, a leather. Just a leather. of eggs spread throughout the gravel and of course the gravel would cave back in and I'm yeah. Uh, yeah, get out deep water there. It works. Yeah. Is that a wooden tip or a metal tip? That's metal, that's barrel metal. Ah, you made it out of barrel again. Oh yeah, little barrel metal. Yeah. Braised it and had a little brazing kit out here. I wonder you didn't make yourself a bus out here. Hey what? Make yourself a bus. A bus? Yeah, to travel with. Oh. I had plans for one. My tundra buggy. Uh huh. I had plans for a big buggy that would. Made a 55 gallon drum. Yeah, that's so. right. I was almost going to think of making, using half drums. Or, God, I said, God, what makes whole drums? <laughs> take the skin and you take the fat off the. Yeah, and soften it. It's more of a softening tool. Uh huh. You just kind of work it over, you know. It's not really all that sharp, you know. Just yeah. A little Work it over. And would it scrape it too? Yeah, oh yeah, I'd scrape it. But I had other tools to scrape it. Then just kind of rub the skin like that and just work it over a shop, you know. Then what did you use to tan it with? Uh, uh, kind of chemical like. Yeah. Well, prior to that, it would go in, oh Christ, we've done everything from piss tan to the most beautiful tans I ever did was bark tan, birch bark, uh -huh. the tannic acid that's in uh, yep. the inner layer of birch bark. It would take a while. It'd take all three months or so to do that. And then I've used uh, chrome tan, which is just chromium alum, potassium yeah. sulfate or something. It's uh, that's a that's what all your all your leather gloves, that blue color that you see on leather, yep. cheap work gloves, and, yep. and in boots before they dye in black or brown, you know, that's all chrome tan leather. I see. And that works. That's that's really. Mm -hmm. And cheap too, it's just a cheap chemical. Yeah. You know, right about the time that, uh, you know, I was decided I was going to run the, the race, I remember, you know, I, I didn't drink much or anything back then anyway, you know, but, or uh, smoke much cigarettes. I'd smoke when I go to town, maybe have some cigarettes or something when I go to town. And, uh, not do much of anything else, but from the day I, uh, you know, I remember from the day I, you know, learned I was going to run the Iditarod, you know, I just, uh, it was like, okay, no beer, you know, nothing. I mean, it was just one track mine, you know, it was just a, it was a trip, you know. Yeah. I remember walking down the street in the night, heading up to Sandy Hamilton's house when I'd be in town, you know, somebody, hey, come on, have a beer, you know. I'd be heading off with my little book up to Sandy's house, you know, or, or getting something together, go making a dog deal over at somebody's house, you know, or trying to con them out of a dog or, or something, you know, or heading back out here to, you know, and I remember just before I left to head to Nenana, Sandy sat me down in the house and he said, here, have this damn beer, calm down, you son of a gun, you know, you know, it just, you know, made me drink that beer, you know, and, 
and you were hyped for the race. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was I was just too getting too serious on him or something. Not that that wasn't good, but it was right. too serious for him, you know. And uh, he made me drink that beer and just before heading off to Indiana. Anyway, like I, it was just it was just I don't know days. Days before I headed to Indiana, a week before I headed to Indiana, I started giving them a little bit of, um, you know, special food that Mike had brought in from Fairbanks, and uh, and then you know just days before I started giving them some good stuff, some liver and chicken and fat, and because I didn't know how to feed this stuff properly anyway, and I definitely didn't know how to work them into it slowly. You know, I, yeah. you know, fish, fish, fish. That's all they ate. You know, and maybe a little bit of grain mixed into it or something or once in a while some fat or uh, they get meat you know little pieces of moose meat but, you know not this like just high protein diet of pork and chicken fat and uh, liver and all that anyway I remember you know probably I hadn't driven them during this time you know and they're filling up with all this stuff and I took off to Indiana and they were just getting sick I mean they weren't sick sick but I mean it's like just their stomachs just, it was coming all up over the place, oh, ah, I was getting sick all over the place on the way to Nenander, and, you know, they just couldn't handle the food, you know, they just didn't, their stomachs weren't used to that kind of food, and of course dogs, you know, when they throw up, it's different than people, they throw up almost purposely sometimes, you know, regurgitate it and eat it again, and yeah. it's just a natural thing, that they were doing that in the way there, and anyway, got over to Manly, and uh, stopped there and headed over to Indiana. Met the guy with the dog truck, John Hewitt, and, and uh, in Fairbanks for a day or so. And off down the highway we go. In this, uh, I don't know what year it was, 1963. It's 1982 now, and it's a 1963 International pickup truck. You know, you know, it's an old thing and uh, nice dog box on the back. You know, two layered dog box, and, and we're heading off down the highway. Me, him, and uh, and Mike McCann, and uh, Mike was real funny on that trip on down there. You know, he he's been in a few crashes, you know, like the plane crash, you know. Yeah. And he don't like John. He's a crazy driver. That old truck with that top heavy dog box, you know, and swinging on he's the curves. He's just swinging on the curves, you know, and oh, 60, 70 miles an hour down the road to Anchorage, you know, and Mike's sitting. Oh, Mike, he had to sit by the door. He's one of these guys where if you're just going to get in a crash. I seen him do it too one time going over the, this bridge. We skidded, and he's he's got the door open, man. He's ready to jump. He don't he ain't gonna stay in that thing. Yeah. And he was sitting right by the door of John's truck, going, "Do you don't you think we should slow down? You know, and now nah, I drive like this all the time. You know, John's just driving down the road. You know, and and, and Don, if a front tire didn't blow, cruising along down this road, front tire blew and whoa, 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 you know, back and forth and dog box just going back and forth and Mike with the door ready to jump out. And anyway, we made it. We pulled off the road and I remember I said something to John about uh, boy, it sure is good you bolted that dog box down to the truck you know, because we had been talking about doing that you know, in yeah. case something happened, you know you know, and sure good you bolted that thing down to the truck. I bet that thing would have got launched otherwise and John said, uh you know, I never did that you know, <laughs> And then after that, Mike was just really paranoid. He was so paranoid, he didn't come back up the highway with John. <laughs> you know, after they dropped me off in Anchorage and I took off in the race, he didn't drop. He didn't fly. He didn't drive back up. <laughs> he flew he, he back up. For flu. <laughs> yeah, flew back up. You know, but down to Anchorage we go, and and uh, you know, it's just like a bunch of hillbillies. You know, Mikey's a crusty old beard, and John, old redneck type looking guy. You know. And, and uh, that old truck, it was, you know, when we'd pull, you know, I remember we had to do this uh, lead dog thing, you know, uh, ceremonial start. Anchorage had no snow, so they couldn't start them in Anchorage. Yeah. So we do a ceremonial start. You bring your dogs by this big Mulcahy Stadium down there, and you bring your dogs there, and you walk up with your lead dog and get in line with your lead dog. And anyway, you know, all these dog trucks, you know, 19... 78, 1980, you know, nice pickup trucks, nice beautiful dog boxes on them. Here's John's old yellow beat up until National sitting there, you know, and we were quite a crew. I remember people, I got a picture of this one guy, you know, when 
was standing in line, you know, just looking at us. We were all ragged, you know, and I got my old yellow patched up snow pants on, you know, and just kind of, he's just like looking at us like that. It's just a neat picture, you know, just looking at us, you know, like, what the hell are these guys? <laughs> Who is this running this race, you know? And, uh, and, uh, anyway, I, we were sleeping and we didn't even have a place to stay for a couple of days, you know, and just parking the dogs beside the road and, you know, not taking showers and sleeping in the sleeping bags. And then we, in the end, we found a place to stay this, which was really nice because, uh, the sled had been broken up and we needed a place to repair it inside, do some epoxy work and stuff. And I had broken it on the way to Indiana and, uh. You know, I'm not used to those light sleds, man. I just yeah. used to beating something around and, and a lot of dog power. And so anyway, we had this thing in the guy's living room on top of his bed, you know, working on the sled, you know. That was our workbench's bed. And it was really nice to do that. And just, you know. Anyway, started off in the race and off we go. Right from, that was it. One sled. Yeah. One okay. sled, the no, whole trip. no other sled that I didn't, we didn't have, that was it, that sled I had to make it, it turned out I had to switch sleds during the race, but, you know, we had a wheel and deal for a sled down in Ruby, because this other one had bit the dust by the time I, hell, it bit the dust right out of Anchorage. So he bought one from a local person in Ruby? Mike rented it from, yeah, a guy down there. Okay, and then that lasted you through to, to uh, the end, to Rome? Yeah. Or no? Yeah. Nice sled, yeah. Yeah. How about food? Who shipped food at? Or uh, Mike took care of all that. He, I went into Fairbanks. Um, you know, just made a quick two, three day trip into Fairbanks. He bought up a whole bunch of food for me: chicken, beef, liver. Uh, got a whole bunch of gutty sacks. You know, he'd just keep running off into the town. You know, coming back. It was the third time I had to go to my bank today. You know. Yeah. He just bullshit. You know. But uh. You know, and just, you know, one thing after another, you know, and bagged up like 40 gunny sacks of, I had a, we went over this guy Bullwinkle's house, he's an old, old fella over there, and he had this old mining claim, and he had all these old construction frames, and we had these huge tables, made these huge tables out of all these construction frames of plastic on top, and I had these hamburger patties, hundreds of them, just, I don't know, a thousand of them or something, you know, just laid out on them freezing, and then bagged up stuff up and went back into town and he drove that stuff down to Anchorage. Shipped it? Yeah, and then the, the trail committee, the Iditarod trail committee takes care of it from there. They get it out. If you, you drop off the stuff, all the bags are marked, Rome, uh, Squinton, uh, you know, all the checkpoints, they, they uh, you know, you mark the bags and seal them up and that, that bag will get there. But they didn't all get there, it turns out, during the race. But oh, God. Did you have red short of food down there? There was a couple of places. Well, one place was really bad at Roan River when you went over the Alaska Range. Uh, the, the weather was too... It was a bad year. It took... This is when they were back in... They were doing the idea of 12 days back in 82. Yeah. They had done it. And, you know, they hadn't done it in the 10 day, 10 and a half days they're doing it now. But, you know, there were some pretty fast races. But uh, that day, that year... Uh, it was the weather was so bad, and there were so many holdups and so many snowstorms. It took um, even the leaders who made it. Well, Rick Swenson won the race that year. It took him uh, 16 days, five hours. It took, and I, I came in two hours after him. So I mean, it took me 16 days, but I mean, it took everybody 16 days. Yeah. All, all the leaders, anyway. It was just a bad year for snow, and the, a lot of times the planes couldn't fly. They couldn't play, fly the food in, and. Uh, and at Roan River, they flew in a few loads, but my bags weren't there. And I was, the front runners got there first, like, say, the first, I don't know. I was running maybe, by the time I hit Roan, I was running maybe 25th, 20th, something like around there, I don't know. And, uh, you know, there had been a lot of people in there, so the people that had scratched, you know, their bags are free game. Uh -huh. Well... You know, I'm one of the last of the front runners to get in there, and those bags are already gone, you know. And I remember, you know, I had a, you know, I had a little food with me to eat for myself and fed the dogs a little, and everybody's taking the 24-hour at Roan River. It's a common spot back then, even nowadays, to take a 24-hour layover. Yeah. And uh, I had no 
food that I remember Joe May giving me a package of hot dogs for myself to eat because I had no more food no more. I had eaten my meal and, you know, I was there for maybe four, five, six hours. I was there six hours is what it was. And towards the end, you know, and I have any food to eat and everybody's saying, you know, well, we'll help you out this way if we can. And, you know, I went out and I acted like I was going to eat the hot dogs and I went and broke the hot dogs all in half and gave all the dogs a piece of a hot dog, you know. Yeah. And there was uh, one of the race marshals that said, well, listen, we got this, uh, sometimes they have like, I don't know what they said, they had horses or cattle or, they said there's some sort of uh, animals they had there in the summer sometimes, and there's some feed they had, maybe it was horses, I guess, I don't know. <coughs> it was oats, yeah. but it had sawdust in it. He said, the only problem is it's got sawdust in it. And I mean, you know, I'm just going, Man, I don't even want to feed that stuff to my dogs, you know. And never mind, take a 24-hour layover, you know, going to a 24. Maybe my food would show up the next day, but maybe it wouldn't because it was bad weather right that day, you know. And uh, and I wasn't going to take a 24 hours, so I headed off across the Farewell Burn, that 90-mile stretch. It's, you know, everybody talks about going across the Farewell Burn. You yeah. know, it's a long haul. It's a, no food. And I headed off across the with no food. Yeah. Food. Dogs. Yeah, but you know, actually, I remember people asking me about it later, and and I'd say, well, this is just like trapline. You know, I knew what it took to get dogs 90 miles of no food. Yeah. You know, and it, I don't know, it wasn't maybe like I had no food too. You know, I mean, but I had basically no calories. You know. Yeah. You know, I didn't have the calories to get them there, but I probably had a snack or something for them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no food. Yeah, so then you got to... Uh, that was uh, Nikolai, and uh, let's see, what was that? That's like the third one to Nikolai, because see, all the front runners had stayed. They were doing that 24 yeah. hours. So now I went from, yeah, I remember back in Rome, that was the first time somebody said to me, this one guy, uh, um, uh, Ed Ferran, you know, he, he was a friendly guy, and he was, had pretty good dogs, and he was, you know, a real racer, you know, he could tell you the, he was one of these guys who could tell you the bloodlines of Swenson's dogs and this guy's dogs, and knew everything, you know, yeah. good guy, you know, but he, he's real sharp with all that stuff, which to this day I couldn't tell you, I can't even tell you where half my dogs come from, you know, yeah. I don't keep track of that stuff, you know, I just run them, and, uh, but he, he said to me, he said, you know, there's three of us lining up for Rookie of the Year. I said, what? You know, oh, yeah, that's right. They got that Rookie of the Year award. You know, he said, yeah, that's that's what the rookies all go for. Man, there's three of us looking like, you know, you know. And I, and that was the first time I really kind of felt like I'm racing, you know. I'm doing more than just trying to get to know them. Yeah. Because, you know, prior to this, there was one place in the race I was like in 40-something position, 43rd position. Uh-huh. You know, first day of the race is really strange. I, uh stopped at this first checkpoint and uh, pulled in at night and all these teams laid all out. You couldn't really see what anybody was doing, you know, people feeding. And, you know, I just, okay, you know, take my dogs out of harness, stretch out this little light gang line I had, and take all the dogs over to the river bank, put them all on, just like you're on the trap line, you know, lay out my sleeping bag, you know, and get in it and, you know, feed all, do all this sort of stuff. Next morning, wake up, it's light, you know, or six hours later, wake up and it's light see all these people starting to get up, you know, we see these guys jumping up out of the sleeping bags, taking the sleeping bag in one motion, into the sled, saying to the dogs, hey, be ready. Dogs pop up, they still got their harnesses on, off they go. I, I'm, I better get going, I better get going, you know, uh, you know, and oh God, I got to roll up my sleeping bag, you know, it's all out on the ground, I got my pad in the ground, I got, you know, these guys are laying in this sled, they're using their bumpy old sled for a pad, you know. Yeah. You know, they just got a sleeping bag. They don't have no cloth and then a pad and a sleeping bag, you know. And, I, oh, I got to get my dogs, you know. Oh, get the harnesses. They're hanging in the tree, you know. And, you know, get all the harnesses and bring them over. Get the dogs one by one. Bring them over, you know. Hour later, I'm off, you know. You know, and I realized at that point, well, bye-bye gang line. <laughs> yeah. You don't, or a tow line, you know. No, or, just I mean, use gang, gang line. line. Gang line. Sorry, you know. Just threw that thing away. After that, dogs never got out of harness, which, you know, they don't 
chew that bad anyway. I'd done that before, but I, you know, on the trap line, you take them out of harnesses. You know, you're staying for the night. You're staying for 12 hours. You know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I learned, you know, and, and like I say, I was way back there for a while. But after a while, I caught on, and uh, and uh, by Nikolai, I'm the first one on Nikolai. Of course, I don't have a 24-hour layover behind me like the guys behind me, but. And I, I think I was, uh, I was heading into McGrath. I was the, uh, lined up to be the first one to McGrath, but this guy Anderson, who lived in McGrath at the time, he, uh, you know, it's a big thing to be the first to McGrath. I don't know what it is. I mean, it's a halfway, I don't know, it's just a big thing to be. It's his hometown, you yeah. know. And so he came rushing on behind me and just uh, pushing and pushing. And I just said, well, oh, be nice, you know, I'm not going to try and catch him, you know, he's just, you know, I'm not going to burn my dog. So it turned out he didn't go much further than that. I think he'd go in or he scratched because he burnt his dogs out driving him so hard into McGrath. But, I, you know, I could have been, you know, as far as, you know, I could have been even the first one in McGrath. Of course, I took my 24-hour McGrath, and then I, you know, all the leaders passed That's me, true. and I'm yeah. back down to whatever, 20th, something like that. And, you know, but I remember it. Cripple. I was back a little bit before that. I remember this uh, neat feeling I had. I remember, you know, dogs' feet are all, you know, getting all cuts, and yeah. which is just normal on the race. But I'm wondering, God, you know, I got uh, two thirds of the race to go. Dogs are tired. They're is these teams coming in, you know, like Joe, Joey Reddington, or Joe Reddington Sr.'s dogs, you know, coming trotting on and looking all healthy and, you know, all nice equipment and everything and saying, how the heck am I even going to get to know him? And I remember uh, just standing there one time and, and, and going, uh, all of a sudden I just thought back to Dan, uh, you know, you know, I just had this, start thinking of all the feeds they, you know, had together in Tan and all the people had given me, you know, donations and and all that stuff and just everything, you know, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I just didn't feel like it was just me racing the race, I just felt like I had this whole town behind me, it was a pretty neat feeling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just a trip, you know, I just got all, and brought the blood, you know, to the head and, you know, and off we went. And, yeah, and it's pretty slow going down the Yukon and a lot of teams ahead of me. I, you know, figure I'm, I'm moving there, but it was, you know, and all the time I'm just racing at my own pace. I was traveling by myself. Yeah. And then at Caltech, I was still traveling by myself. And at Caltech, you head over the cut hills. Caltech cut off. Yeah, to head over the hills to the coast. And, uh, and it was pretty bum, real bum weather in there. We were on snowshoes in that 90 mile stretch at times trying to find the trail and just making a trail even though we had about I think there was like seven leaders ahead of us back then and uh, there were about four of us together one of those guys was Don Honey down river he, at Ruby and a uh, good dog team experienced driver he raced the idea a bunch of times before come in in the you know top ten you know before and uh um, you know, and yeah, it just, it was the first time I was really traveling with a group because we were stuck in this snow and stuff, you know, and me and Don ended up doing a lot of the work, you know, and, uh, and after that, after we got through that snow and started getting a little close to the coast and started breaking away from, you know, finding a trail that we could start cruising on without getting, you know, held up by snowshoeing and stuff, uh, uh, we just kind of traveled together, you know, hit stop and. I'd stop, I'd stop, he'd stop and for rest, you know, and, uh, you know, were, we were still racing, you know, he said, he told me later, he said, you know, I'd hit that, that hard trail and I could see the distance between us spreading, you know, I'd hit that soft stuff and I'd see you come right up behind me, you know, you know, a little soft trail and, and so we got to Uniclete and he had a friend in Uniclete he was staying with and he had me stay with him, it was sort of like from then on we just traveled together, you know, and, uh, he helped me out in the villages and showed me. It was just interesting, you know, just watching how he did things and uh, started learning a lot. And, and uh, the heck, 
is the village? Well, from Uniclee to Tarnian's Shack Tool, and that was that was a he that was one of the most incredible parts of the race. Winds, winds. It was big time wind. It was uh, at the uh, there were five of us traveling together, and there's some hills out of uh, out of Uniclee that you kind of you know, up and down. And then all of a sudden, about, I don't know, maybe 20 miles with the last 15 really open. But about 20 miles from uh, Shack Tool, it, gets, it just gets real open. You drop down to these flats and head along this. It was so windy, I couldn't even tell you the geography. A lot of the trip, I'd never even seen the Alaska Range. i never seen a lot of... Weather's too bad. The weather was so bad where we travel. I never, I've never seen a lot of the Iditarod Trail, you know. Yeah. And But, uh, <clears throat> but anyway... Uh, we started into this wind, and we lost one guy. You know, he just turned back. He decided to go back. He didn't want to go into the wind. And the wind was so bad that in Shack Tulik at the time, there was a guy, Brian Anderson, who flies in the area. He was flying the race with some reporters or something like that. He said he went out to, at one point, he went out to check his airplane out at the uh, Shack Tulik airstrip. And he said he was cocked about 10, 10, mile, 10 degrees or 15 degrees out of the wind. And his plane was just lifting off of the into the air, and he said that uh, his wind speed indicator registered uh, 70 knots when it was gusting. 70 knots, 15 degrees out of the wind. So you know, you figure you're probably dealing with like 60 mile an hour gusts or at something least. like that, at least. You know, um, it was like the kind of stuff where you get a good gust, and it would be a good steady gust that would last for a bunch of seconds. You know. By the time it was over, man, the whole team was just blown completely sideways. Sled was on its side. You just upright the sled again, get the dogs turned, head off into the wind again. And uh, I was really, I don't know, it was a highlight. Of, it was pretty neat because of what uh, I got my lead dogs to do. And uh, anyways, you know, no, nobody else could get their lead dogs to go through the wind. And so we all decided to... It was too hairy. If anybody ever got lost, you know, they'd be all by themselves. It's too dangerous to travel by yourself. So we all decided that no matter what happens, we're all in it together. You know, just keep track of the guy behind you. Just have your dogs right on the right on the ass of the, you know, yeah. guy behind. You know, and, and just keep everything real tight and just travel. And I had this real thin fur dog. Just looked like a sprint dog. It's not grizzly and. Uh, it's just amazing. It wasn't maybe that cold a wind. It wasn't no 30 below or something, but it was zero. All I know is, man, you couldn't bear your hands for a second. I couldn't even put on my big, I had this really warm outer parka that I used to throw on over my windbreak and, and stuff. And I couldn't even, I didn't even dare get that out of the sled bag to put it on. Because in order to do it, I'd have to take off my mitts and I'd have to, you know, just do the whole bit. And you couldn't do anything, you know. And the only thing you could do was jump in your sled or something if it, you know, and, uh, but yeah, it's a hellacious wind, and just little by little, that, I don't know how long it took us to do that, 15 miles, 14 miles, it was just all day, and just by dark, uh, um, we are starting, we knew we were getting close to Shack Tool, looking, and pulled on into Shack Tool, and caught up with the top seven, and they were amazed. They were just, as a matter of fact, some of them pissed off. You know, well, one of them in particular was pissed off. You know, Rick Swenson and Susan, they didn't care, you know, and they're good natured anyway, you know. But there yeah. was one guy, he's God damn, you know, he caught up to us, you know. Because they were held, they couldn't go on, you know. But in the wind that they were held up in, we made it in, uh -huh. you know. And at the same time, Herbie Nookbook had tried to make a blast to Koyuk and, uh, in the same wind. And he didn't make it. You know, he was a big time coastal driver. You know, I was really proud of my dogs that they made it through a wind that everybody in the almost bought to dust. And it ruined his, his, that was it for him. After he got back to Shack Tulik, his dogs were shot from being in the wind. He had to hold up in his sleeping bag in the, in the sled. Yeah. And everything couldn't go on. So I was pretty proud of the dogs for leading everybody in. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. A good leader. That was who was your leader? You didn't have the half wolf dog then, did you? Have who? The dog that was half wolf? No, no, he wasn't in the race. He, he wasn't was in the race. Nah, he was too old by then. By then, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But then it was.
was just plod on through, you know, past the, uh, there was another guy up front that was um, traveling with the top seven that was lined up to be rookie of the year, you know, if he could hold his position, past him going into White Mountain and, uh, you know, shook his hand, hi, you know, met him, you know, and, and uh, now I'm rookie of the year. I'm lining up to be rookie of the year. All I got to do is hold two, you know. And, yeah. And we took off out of White Mountain. Me, Don Honey, still traveling together. There were times when me and Don Honey. This is uh, one day before the end of the race. And there were times that me and Don and we had this other guy, Bob Chopak, that was traveling with us. And, you know, there were times that Don was in first place, Bob was in first place, I was in first place, and then of course Rick and them would come by us, and they'd be in first place. It was just hot. And, you know, it's just neat to say you know, there were times when you were in first place the day before the end of the I did arrive. Yeah. You know? Of course, it didn't mean anything because at any time Rick and Susan and them wanted to, they could just blast on by you, you know. Um, I mean, I was doing pretty good, but I wasn't doing that good, you know. And uh, Well, look at the thousands of dollars they had invested in equipment mm -hmm. and dogs and training versus... $30,000 versus 4500 Yeah. Yeah, that's how much money it took us. And, uh, but anyway, the, there was one point me and Don were in the, uh, and Bob were in the lead. We sat by this hill out of the wind, and uh, there was some pretty open country just beyond the hill. It was getting dark, and we were resting, and those Rick and Susan and the other, and there's six of them, they went past us, and, and Don says, ah, let's just finish our coffee. Bob got right up and choo, off with them, you know, and Don says, just, ah, just wait a minute, you know, we'll, we'll take off, you know, in a minute, you know, and, which would have been fine if I had a headlamp instead of my old army thing with the low watt bulb and, the, and he had had a decent battery on his high powered one, but here it's getting dark and we go around the hill, the wind starts hitting us, we see everybody's headlamps off in the distance and, yeah. and uh, would have been no problem catching them, you know, we had had a rest for whatever, 20 minutes or something like that, and they had been running their dogs for a little bit, you know, we could have caught them, you know, it was no problem, but darn, that trail would blow in, we'd have to stop, looking for the trail with these bum headlamps, Don actually switched to a, a battery that he had thrown away as no good, but had left in a sled in case he needed it, mm -hmm. he switched to that battery, and I'm, and his was still better than mine with full battery juice, because the bulb on mine was so, you know, just the wrong, wrong wattage, you know. And, uh, oh, man, just watching those guys. You'd see those guys out ahead, you know, they'd stop. You'd see all of them stop, and all of a sudden, you'd see these headlamps running off this way, running off that way. Somebody would haul it. Somebody would haul it. And you get seven guys together, seven dog teams, lost in a snowstorm like that, and it's like a locomotive, you know. I mean, they might stop. But somebody, one of those seven's going to find the trail. And then it's off they go again. You know, and there's two of us, bud, headlamps. We're losing the trail more often. We're finding it less easy. Gonzo. They're gone. All night long. We're out there in the dark. Finally, had uh, no, no rest, you know, from, I don't know, we're just out all night, you know, for the whole dark. And I was in darkness. And, <coughs> Next day we came out at the bottom of the, what they call these topcock hills, you know, came out of the hills and there's these big, oh, you basically run along the coastline to Nome now, you know, I don't know, 30 miles from Nome or 40 miles from Nome, I don't know what the heck it is. And, and here's uh, the seven guys, we can see them down there resting at the bottom of the hills, it's still pretty windy, but, you know, it's a good trail, it's marked real good, you're close to Nome. And, uh, Dawn most of the night had he had the still had the best headlamp he had and he had really worked the heck out of his dogs getting us through that snowstorm mm -hmm. and he by the time we came out of the hills I actually had better dogs than he had but only by virtue of the fact that you know he had huh, he had brought me through the storm you know he had the headlamp you know whatever was left of it you know and <clears throat> whipping his you know getting the whip out and snapping it and get up there and dragging him over. You know, he did more of that than I did that night. And uh, and so 
so when we got to the bottom of the hills, just as we they saw us coming, they took off. And there had been a helicopter down there talking to them, uh, you know, a news helicopter. We pulled up to the helicopter, and guys told us that Don went over to them, came back to me, said they'd been here two hours. They had two hour rest on us. They made it here two hours before us. They actually had trouble too, you can see. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. It wasn't that, but still, two hours is insurmountable. You can't. Yeah, you can't it's make way, it up. Two hour rest on, on dogs, and I bet it was easier on those dogs during the night, too. There's no way in heck we're going to catch them. But uh, Don came over and said, They got two hour lead, you know, rest on us. And I said, Man, we better get going, you know. And he said, Hey, listen, man, they got two hour rest on us. You know, we're not going to catch them. You know, that's Rick and Susan, and, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to catch them. And he listen, and he just, you know, I was all hyped up. And, and he, say, and he just, you know, you know, hit me on the back. He said, hey, listen, man, we're both in the top ten. You're rookie of the year. I'm in the top ten. You know, you're rookie of the year, and you're in the top ten. we got 50 miles to Nome. There's nobody behind us for 40 miles. You know, that's what the helicopter told him, too. You know, nobody had left White Mountain because of the storm. Yeah. Uh, take it easy, man, you know. Uh, you had some caffeine pills, you know, and... Uh, know whatever they have, those things to keep you awake, you know, and he said, here, gave me a bunch of them, and, and uh, nah, those, no those things from the store, you know, whatever yep. the heck they are, caffeine, <coughs> and uh, he said, and he said, just keep awake and enjoy the trip, you know, and off we went on into Nome, we started getting close to, uh, oh, I don't know, somewhere down the line, and Hit and I highway. and I and I just said, uh, oh, hit safety. We're at safety. We went and ate some caribou soup. You know, everybody else. They said the other guys, when they hit there, it was like a race. You know, there's seven guys there. They're racing, man. You know, and uh, of course, me and Don should have maybe been racing too. You know, I mean, we're traveling all this time together. But when the end comes, I mean, it's all every man for himself. You know, yeah. and uh, I don't know. It's just the feelings. It's just the way I was too, you know. Maybe Don's used to traveling. Maybe if it had been somebody else with Don, maybe Don would have felt different. But just the way I, I was too, you know. I'm not much of a cutthroat or whatever. And, and uh, we go out and get ready to hook up the dog. You know, we're get ready to get the dogs ready, and off, off we go down the trail. And at that point, I just thought back and I said, "Well, Don, you know, if it wasn't for this guy, you know, from." Uniclete on on, or halfway from Caltech to Uniclete, I mean, you know, and last night in the damn storm burned his dogs, I could see that if I wanted to, I could probably pass them, yeah. you know, and be the first, and be into Nome in eighth place, you know, yeah. but, uh, I don't know, it's just a really good feeling, all the, what he had done for me, you know, and, uh, and I just said at that, every now and then I'd just stop, let him get ahead, trot on along, just talk to the dogs real easy, you know, and I remember for the first time in the race, too, along the trail, I mean, I wasn't trying to get the dog going, but, you know, uh, usually on the trap line, you know, dogs try to take a, you know, leak on the tree or the, something like that, or they yeah. want to sniff something, you know, it's like, it's like, hey, get up there, you, you, what are you doing, you know, you get going, you know, but like on the Iditarod, you know, for the whole race, it's like, okay, guys, let's go, you know, because you just want to, you don't want to overwork nobody, you know, if a dog's holding back and not pulling, it's like, what's the matter with him? It's not like on the trap line where you know you only have to go 20 miles and too bad for you, buddy, you know, you pull that sled, you know, you know you're lazy today, you know, I mean, this is, you might have 100 miles to go that day, you know, if a dog's holding back and you got tummy ache, man, you push him, you know, mm -hmm. so here it is the last day and I'm just tired of putting up with these sniffing dogs and stopping dogs, and of course they're all tired too, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I just took this marker that was along the trail, and I just said, it was like the first time in the whole race in the first 16 days, and I just whacked it on that sled. I said, you get up there, and it was like wham, you know. It was like, wow, first time in 16 days of years of trap line training, you know, it just snapped up, and okay, you know. And, and I didn't say no more, but I didn't want no more peeing, I didn't want no more aggravation. I was too tired. You know, we had 20 miles to go. You're going to get all the food and hay you want, you know, and it's going to be happy times, you know, but just don't give me a hard time. No more, you jerks, you know. <laughs> you know, and off 
we went trotting on in and I just stayed about three minutes behind him all the way across the finish line three minutes behind him. Uh, the tenth place? Ninth place. Ninth place. Yeah. Which paid you? Eh, fifteen hundred dollars for Yerky of the Year and thirty thirty two or something like that. Thirty two for ninth place. Yeah. Yeah. That forty I guess that's forty seven hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah, forty seven. That made forty seven hundred dollars. Most money I ever had in my pocket at one time. I had forty seven hundred dollars in my pocket. I cashed the two checks and no. <laughs> Ah, that was something else to have that much money sitting in my pocket. Of course, I guess that wasn't all mine, but... And they flew the dogs back to where? Tanana. Back into Tanana? Yeah, back into Tanana, you know, after the yeah. all the ceremonies in Nome. And, and when I landed at the... I guess they knew I was coming. And when I landed the, uh, at the airstrip in Tanana, I mean, just pickup trucks, snow goes, the fire trucks were there, the cop car, I mean, the sirens were going, the, the PA was going on the fire trucks, the lights were flashing, the, they grabbed my dogs and threw them in a pickup truck, had the chains all out in the pickup truck, and sat me in the fire truck, and, all right, you're getting a parade, and off we go, down Front Street, and this guy, Dave Webb, you know, he's a real ham, you know, and he's on the microphone, you know, just bullshit, no way, you know, and, <laughs> Nice. Like I say, there'd never be. I mean, if I ever raced it again, there's a whole aspect that would never be in it again. I tried to get a sponsor for a couple of years after. It's real big time, too. I spent $200 on a phone call the next winter, had a $200 bill at his house, Mike McCann's house, and sent out these 30 packets of, you know, all these pages of, like, uh, you know, magazines that I, you know, get copies of this magazine, I was on the front cover, and uh, articles that had been in the papers, you know, people would say for me, I copied them on Xerox, and had all this stuff, and then a little letter, and, you know, about, you know, I'm looking for a sponsor, and sent them off to this company and that company, and, you know, I tried real hard to get a sponsor for, for years after that, but, but it would never be, you know, I always, knew, you know, that it would, it would never be the same as that first year. If I raced it again, it would always be, I'd go up to, you know, Lester in town or one of the big guys in town and say, hey, can I rent a dog, you know, or, or I borrow a dog too, but I mean, it, it, you know, it was the first long distance guy that ever left Dan, uh, I mean, except for maybe in the old days when the trap line teams used to come out of town and race the sprint races, but, you know, these long distance races, you know, it was, a, it was a, the first one, it was like a, the town's team, kind of, for a lot of people felt that way anyway. And, and here this year, you win the 80 mile Folger race, mm -hmm. Canada, with your, yeah, with your team. Yeah, with my scrap dogs, <laughs> wipe out the, wipe out a yeah, you know, Freddie, he could have had some, uh, he could have had some more training on his dogs this year and stuff and done better, but, heck, I mean, look at me. I mean, nobody had less training on their dogs this year. This is the, probably the, the worst year I've ever had as far as, uh, heavy duty training on because I've been so busy, you know, with the family in town and, uh, and, uh, working on, uh, you know, stuff for next summer, you know, for the fishing and stuff. You and know. you didn't do anything as far as trapping? No, you? no, because, you know, it's just, it actually, a lot of people didn't trap because of the fur prices, but whether, I mean, that was, it worked out good that they didn't trap this year, but I mean, it wasn't like, that was why I decided that in the fall that I had too many broken down trucks, too many, uh, my outboard blew up in the fall, I was not going to be late for fishing next spring. Yeah. You I, I just needed a winter off. I just needed a winter to concentrate on this. Because you go out trap and you're gone all winter. You come into town, you get so many other things to do besides work on the equipment. The equipment you know, and I just need some concentrated time to work on it. That's what I did. Got a nice truck together and yeah. outboards about ready to go. And, you know. So now you got the Iditarod done, and then it's time to, uh, that you uh, went back into Tanana. Well, you build a boat. Oh, the 32-foot boat. Yeah. yeah. 
and that was all done with chainsaw and all the power, uh, every, all the timber and, and, and lumber came from out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. A few pieces of plywood on the transom. But yeah, plank board, plank sides, ribs, everything. All spruce. Spruce trees from outside, yeah. yeah. Cut with a chainsaw mill. Chainsaw mill? Yeah, what it's just a chainsaw a, mill like. It's, uh, yeah, on a chainsaw, you usually you get an extra long bar. You know, longer than your normal firewood cutting type bar, you know, 30 inch long bar or something. Yeah. And there's, it's just this clamp on attachment. And all it does is it, uh, you know, just regulates your, you know, your, uh, well, first cut, you use a guide. You know, you lay a tree down flat and you, you know, you get a flat board and you just use this, you put this guide on that flat board and you take your first cut and then you got a nice flat surface on this. It's like a three-sided log, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you just lay the, the guide of that chainsaw mill. It, it just bolts onto the chainsaw bar and it lays sideways and you just take off another slice. It's like cutting cheese or something with a, you know, some sort of slicer where it takes off just the certain, yeah, you can cut boards real accurately, a quarter inch. You can cut an eighth inch board if you want one inch board, you know, you just adjust it to how much you want to cut it. Take 10, yeah, I don't know, 10 minutes to cut a 16 foot board or something, you know. And you built the chines, all the planking, mm -hmm. and the boat was what dimensions? You were 32, what was the beam on that boat? Uh, beam, let's see, the beams, the uh, bottom or the sides? The up width. Up. The width. width up top, boy, yeah. I bet that's... The bottom was eight foot wide bottom. It was a pretty wide boat for the length. Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, relatively, you know. Yeah, but it was uh, eight, so God, it must have been 12 foot, three foot sides. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, they're spreading out at 12 foot or something. But did you design it for a specific thing? Uh, it was basically, when I built the thing, it was, uh, I was just gonna build it, it was just gonna be a barge. And I had gotten that big motor uh, that huge motor. I mean, prior to this, you know, my biggest motor I ever owned was an 18 horse, old beat up 18 horse that used to run around here. But uh, yeah, I got this big motor figure, and I was gonna and I was gonna put a houseboat type prop on it, a real low pitch prop on it, and I figured the boat would be like, uh, yeah, you know, barge, you know, mm -hmm. travel down river, and you know, may, hopefully it'd make a little bit of headway up river, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, uh, you know, I had all these books. Uh, like Evinroot, uh, yeah, Evinroot puts out their 93 models of outboards every year, you know, and in it, you know, they show all these boats with these out, with these, their outboards on the back, you know. Yeah. Most of them are real fancy boats, you know, but you get a kind of an idea of hull shape. And I never built a boat before, or even owned that many boats, you know. But, uh, you know, it, it ended up being fancier than just a bar, just in terms of looking at it, I guess. But I, I just never figured it would go that very good. But but uh, spent all summer long and months, 16-hour days. I'd be out there in the evening, and out there in the morning, epoxy all over me. And built it, I had no nails in it. It's all put together with glue. You know, this modern epoxy, you know, which I spent. That was what the most of the cost of the boat was. It cost me about, <coughs> I figured the whole boat cost $600 to build. Mm -hmm. Which for a 32 foot long boat ain't bad. No. No. I mean, no. the boat probably was worth 10,000 or I don't know, something when I was, you know. I mean, that's the way people were talking that it was worth at least that, you know, when it was done. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was really made nice. I had epoxy inside and out. It was a sealed hull, it was completely sealed. Every little crack, every little. It was, it was this special epoxy that supposedly you could sink the boat underwater for you know, a week or a year, and it would never take on water. And to this day, it's it's still like that, except for there's a lot of places in the boat, being a work boat, that I've hit with things and chipped off the paint. And, and, but they use it on sailboats that have wet hulls inside and out, and they don't take up water. It's made to keep the wood dry. It was really quite a neat thing. So there were no fasteners from the plank to the, to the chines? Mm -hmm. I used little nails, galvanized nails. I would, you know, I'd put the glue on it and I'd use these little nails to hold it in place 
like when I put the ribs together, you know, you got your two sides and yeah. the bottom, you know, when I'd put those together, I had these little table, I'd, you know, form, I'd put them in, I'd nail the corners together, put the glue on, nail the corners together. If I wasn't, if I wasn't careful when I was moving those to the resting spot where they were gonna, the glue was going to set up, if I hit that thing or something like that, it would have moved that angle, and that's how flimsy yeah. that that's how much the nails held the boat together let's put it that way uh -huh, uh -huh. I think there's four structural bolts in the whole back by the transom I just decided to when I glued it I decided to use bolts it was a hard place to get a clamp and I just bolted there's four structural bolts in the whole boat so then you decide to uh, move on and go into tan and all and was that uh, some of the purpose for building the boat that was the purpose actually we were going to move you know, I wasn't, you know, from, I'd go down in the fall to the Yukon and maybe fish with Russ Wood or something in the fall. And usually I'd get there at the end of commercial, you know, because that's when he's all doing, through doing his in high intensity fishing. And so I wouldn't be bothering him, you know, and he'd have his fish wheel sitting there and no, you know, no reason to turn it on. He'd say, hey, listen, the thing's just sitting there. Come on in in the fall, put up 400 fish, you'll have fish when you come to town in the winter. So I'd go in there and he'd turn it on for me. I'd help him out of camp and bring his rafts down for maybe, you know, uh, you know, just help him out a little and he'll help me out. But I always get there at a time when, you know, it's right after commercial when maybe there had been some fights, you know, during this high intensity fishing, you know, and that's my fish spot, that's my fish spot, you know. You're taking my fish, you're too close to me, you, know, you get too big a net, you know. And I just had this sense that, you know, fishing around town was, uh, you know, I didn't want to be another, uh, you know, another thing to aggravate people. I mean, that's the nice thing about living out here, you don't bother nobody, you know. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I didn't figure I'd, that would be a good place to go down and set up a fish, because that was the main reason for going out, you know, I mean, it, I had these big teams now, you know, 14 dogs, 17 dogs, I actually, in the summer I left, I had like a whole bunch of litters of pups, I mean, it was just, you know, just a mass of pups, you know, and, uh, but, uh, you know, and I had a, there was a bum fish here, and I just decided I, you know, I had to get rid of a lot of good dogs, it's just, there's no this was the year, the winter before, you know, it's just the winter before this summer. And I decided this is it. You know, I'm not going to have this happen again. I'm not going to build up a good dog team with all these good dogs. I had to get rid of that dog grizzly, you know. I mean, you can imagine having a dog that did that for you and the idea to rod and then having to take her out in the woods, you know, get, you know, put her, put her, put her to sleep, you know, put her down. I mean, yeah, you know, I wasn't going to do that again. I had to do it once before when I had about six dogs or something. And I had to do it, you know, that first year when we had that trouble with running out of food. But this was too much, you know. I mean, I had too much invested in these dogs to just do that. And so we were going to move, head down river to the mouth of the Yukon or something, find a place, stretch a river where there's just nobody, and just set up a camp where we could take care of the dogs and, and not have this happen to us again. And, but I got down to Tana and... Uh, Right, so everybody's saying, hey, listen, there's no reason to move, you know, I mean, just, you know, I show up with this big boat, it was still a good way to get out of the river, we loaded all the dogs on the deck, we put, I had the baby crib sitting in the middle of it, you know, we had a little girl by then, and, um, you know, a thousand pounds of supplies, everything was, you know, in the boat, you know, that we needed to get through the next winter down on the Yukon, and, and that was the reason for it, you know, we didn't want to move in the winter, you know, wanted to move in the summer so we could have time to set up something for the winter, you know. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> anyway, put the put the darn boat in the river, and, uh, and for, yeah, I couldn't, there was no room in between the riffles, <coughs> you know, the, yeah, I mean, you just kind of goose the gas, and, you know, next thing you know, you're, you're a few hundred yards up river, and then there's another riffle, you know, you can't, big boat like that, though, you can hardly turn it around a river like this, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, for the first time I saw, hey, I didn't even touch the throttle hardly, and this thing just flew. This thing just came right out of the water, and just, uh, you know, so, 
Yeah, it was a head down river on it, and loaded up everything and head down and hit Tanner anyway. And yeah, people just were nice to us.